Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Please let me introduce you to our speaker, Kyla Gucci of Cosmetic Transformations in Peterborough, Ontario. She is one of the world's leading providers of micropigmentation tattoos, including semi-permanent makeup, replacement eyebrows, 3D simulated areolas, scar revision, skin camouflage tattooing. Without further ado, let's welcome Kyla. Thank you, Natalie. Can you see my screen? Can everyone see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Okay, I'm delighted to be here and to be talking about um, 3D aerial tattooing. I'm a strong supporter of Raw Day and I'm very honored to be selected to, to be speaking. Um, I've experienced both the pitfalls and the benefits of tattooing. Uh, I am a cancer survivor myself, and so I understand both sides of the equation, not just as a patient, but as a practitioner. And as I was trained as a chemist, and then I went on into art history and medical illustration, I have a background in both the sciences and the arts, and I believe they're mutually reinforcing and both very applicable uh, to the art and science of uh, 3D aerial or tattooing. I just wanted to start by saying that chest tattoos are a popular non-surgical option. They range from areola repigmentation, scar camouflage tattooing to decorative canvases of hope. And they're often paired with options like prostheses as well as surgical options, which we're gonna discuss later on in the talk. Now keep in mind throughout my talk that choosing none of these options uh, is also a valid, um, also a valid uh, choice. Can everyone hear me? I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Um, You're good. I'm good. Okay. Thanks. Um, give me some copper wire, a big pen, and a remote control car. I can build you a tattoo machine, but give me a computer. And I'm totally lost. So I do apologize for uh, uh, technology not being my, my, my forte. Um, the most chosen form of chest tattooing is 3D aerial or tattooing. And uh, as I'm a firm believer in making sure everyone understands the terminology before we get into the nitty gritty, I want us all to look at this diagram of a nipple aerial or complex or knack. Uh, you might hear the word knack. And when I first started this, I had no idea what the surgeons were talking about until I looked it up. Um, so under, and you need to know that in order to understand what the tattoo is aiming to represent. So in layperson's terms, the central area marked with the number one is the nipple. The circular to ovoid uh, circle outside of that inner circle is the areola. And uh, the little bumpy areas uh, marked by number three are the textured Montgomery glands or tubercula, named after the South African doctor, Dr. Montgomery, who realized those, that texture is what helped the baby latch on uh, when it was suckling. Now, in terms of what 3D areola tattooing is, the basic definition that you'll find is that it's the three-dimensional illusion on a two-dimensional or flat surface of a seeming projecting nipple against a textured areola. And how is it done? Well, it involves four skill sets that I truly believe are um, necessary and each one of them as important as the other. Uh, the first is safety knowledge. The second is artistry, uh, which is probably the one that more people are interested in knowing about. And I think for artistry, we'll focus today on realism and color theory, uh, technique and empathy. So again, safety, artistry, technique, and empathy. And I've color coded them and they'll be color coded during the talk so that you can kind of frame the knowledge around those four core uh, skill sets of how 3D aerial or tattooing is achieved. At the end of each of the skill sections, I'm going to give some advice to attendees on how to assess a technician's ability and advice to technicians or surgeons who might be watching across the country on how to further develop these skills. Now, let's start with safety. Tattooing involves implanting pigments or ink into the second layer of the skin called the dermis, and that's roughly just over one millimeter deep. It feels like a warm sensation when the needles are in the skin that subsides as soon as the technician is out of the skin. People liken it to the feeling of waxing, uh, not as bad as laser, but almost like a rubber band. Now remember, you're always in control and you can tell the technician to stop 
And while it only takes 20 to 30 minutes per side, that could be stretched out to an hour per side if you are feeling discomfort or the uh, technical ability of the technician uh, isn't as um, adept as, as, as it should be. Now, because it requires breaking the skin barrier, tattooing carries certain health risks, uh, such as infection and allergic reaction. Uh, I experienced both of those when I was a cancer survivor and had tattooing done and living through those experiences have helped inform my current practice and why safety is so important to me and why I choose to work in a medical facility rather than a spa or just a medical office. Now risks can be reduced by following what's called routine practices, which you may have heard about in this COVID era and um, infection prevention and control is often shortened to IPAC. So if I'm talking about IPAC, again, that is signifying infection prevention and control, which mitigate the risks of tattooing. Now, there are government sites that you can access across the country with IPAC information on tattooing. And these are wonderful um, documents that include what to look for on the premises, uh, such as, you know, clean spaces, bake machines, bake cords, uh, hot and cold running water, uh, gloves that are changed whenever, you know, the point of contact with the area uh, is compromised, um, and, and all the other things that are important to know. Um, Ontario's Body Safe program pioneered this approach and it's a resource for all provinces and territories. This Body Safe link will be available in the chat at the end of the talk. And even if you're not in Ontario, uh, and I'm not just being Ontario centric, I'm actually from Calgary, Alberta, uh, but uh, th this Body Safe program really did uh, start the trend and it's very succinct and, and, uh, and a wonderful resource for both uh, attendees and practitioners. In terms of safety advice, just to sum up the safety uh, skill set section, what can you as attendees who might be wanting or contemplating this service do to ensure the safety of the technician? And what can the technicians and surgeons watching do when it comes to tattooing? Uh, number one, you should wait a minimum of six to eight months. And this knowledge is based on one of the other sources that I'll provide at the end of the talk, not just my experience in this industry. And sometimes up to one year if you've had radiation or active chemotherapies, because the skin is considered too friable, uh, that's the medical term, too compromised to be tattooed. And you want to ensure that your scarring is no longer vascular no longer purple, pink, or red is what vascular means, is the trapped hemoglobin in, in the skin. And you also want to wait that long because the reconstructed mounds uh, need to stabilize with gravity. And as disappointing as it sounds to wait that long, it's even more disappointing if you're tattooed too soon and then gravity shifts the mounds and then the tattoos are asymmetrical. For reconstructed nipples, it's very important to wait at least six months. It used to be six weeks, and they bumped it up to six months as best practice in North America and the most recent uh, survey of best practices, which is also included on the reference list at the end of this talk. You should always consult the surgeon to ensure it's a safe option if you have any worries or the client does. And check your local public health unit to see if your technician that you're considering is in good standing or if they've even registered with the public health unit. And for technicians, you should also get in touch with your public health inspector for advice on how to keep yourself and your staff and your clients safe and to endorse your services in the community. Now we're going to move on to the artistry section. I know we are galloping uh, through quite, a, quite a, a lot of information here, but I want to keep it to the core things that are important, not just for someone considering tattooing, but someone who's providing that service. And I see that as actually a mutually reinforcing relationship. The more the client knows what is expected of the technician, and the more the technician knows what the client might be looking for, the better communication and relationship that can be established to ensure that people contemplating this service can really have what they want to look like moving forward. As a two-time cancer survivor myself, I know this is not about vanity. This is about regaining control over your life and reframing your body on your own terms. And it's very important to understand what you want and to be able to communicate that with your technician. So in terms of artistry, 
Realistic 3D aerial or tattoos require a lot of different skills um, and they're honed by studying mathematics. Math underlies everything beautiful from music, architecture, yes, even nipple uh, and areolas. Uh, color theory, perceptual psychology, because you have to understand how the brain works in order to understand how to create illusions and a whole lot of practice. Now we're gonna focus, as I said, for the artistry skill set specifically on how to achieve realism through shading and mathematics and the color theory, uh, which is what often makes a lot of clients nervous when they are first tattooed because they don't understand why the colors look the way they do and how different they look when they're healed. So this is important information for you if you're gonna receive this service and if you're going to provide this service. Now what's interesting about realism and color theory because it was actually Leonardo da Vinci who wrote the first codex, Codex A, about areolas and how to uh, portray them on a flat surface. And you might be wondering, well, why was Leonardo da Vinci drawing nipple areolas? But it was pornography of the day. And the more titillating you could create a nipple areola, the more the patron or patroness would be willing to pay. And what you see in the center of the screen there is da Vinci's Codex A for areola. And in it, he talks about to achieve like a ball or a kind of conical element, like the nipple projecting from a flat surface. It depends on the light source and what angle it's coming at, but generally there should be highlights, then kind of a graded shading towards almost a U at the bottom of the circle, which creates that kind of illusion with the cast shadow underneath of a projecting nipple areola. And what I've included below is uh, some of the examples of artists uh, across this wonderful country who are in good standing with their public health unit, who you can see are achieving uh, what Leonardo da Vinci has kind of set out there in print in one way or another to the best of their ability. And what's interesting when you're contemplating uh, an artist's work Sometimes it's difficult if you just see their work on their own, but if you line them up with other uh, objects of the same kind, it helps you see what you like and what you don't like. And this is um, kind of brought to the fore in terms of what you can do as an attendee or um, a potential client who might be seeking this service in terms of understanding realism in the artistry is to learn what to look for and to learn the terminology. So. Uh, Leonardo says that in terms of realism, uh, shading, highlights, and the lights are so very important. And if you look at my work over the last uh, couple decades that I've been working, at the very far left is one of the first areola drawings I ever did. I was very proud of it at the time. Uh, and you can see I'm, I'm kind of doing exactly what he says. I have the highlight at the top. I have graded shade at shadow and you have that U underneath. Um, about 10 years into uh, my practice, you see the drawing uh, in the lower middle uh, where you see a bit more detail, some more effort uh, achieving highlights. Around this time, I start researching the perceptual psychology papers on how to, how highlights can be uh, best represented and interpreted by the brain. And you see some of my uh, work in, in the middle there on the computer of just looking at different colors and different shading. And what you see on the far right is actually a more recent tattoo in my practice that I've done that is on a flat surface using the shading techniques uh, and perceptual psychology to understand how uh, the brain interprets light on a cast object and how highlights such as and half downs and core shadows and reflected light. And again, all of this terminology, you can just get off Wikipedia in terms of, of shading of a circle or of a cone. And you can even print this out, bring it to your technician and say, you know, I like these highlights and I want, you know, like that crepey skin effect with the little white highlights that I've done on the right. And some people really want that. Other people actually, and beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, prefer the look of that very first nipple that I did. I'm actually still surprised that people find that beautiful compared to the right, but everyone has their own uh, understanding of how they wanna look. And so Raw Day is all about learning about your choices of how to reframe your experiences on your terms. And so learning what you like and what you don't like in terms of highlighting or shadow or texture or lack of texture is very important. Now, another thing you can do, and I know this sounds a little bit odd, but I am, diagnose obsessive compulsive, so I think about these things on a whole other level, is to take a non-toxic plasticine or clay 
and to, to mold it. And actually it's easier and people find it easier to artistically create an act or nuclear complex in clay or plasticine than they can draw it. But studies have shown that if a technician actually works and does that, they have a better understanding than when they work in two dimensions trying to create that three dimensional object. And you can see on the far left is the little plasticine that my son helped me make. He's probably gonna be in therapy for years helping me do all these nipple areolas all the time. And then with the flashlight on it, on the very same object, you see how the cast light really brings out, especially the glands on the end of that nipple. And you can see in the um, tattooing, you can always perfect it over time as you add more layers of color and detail. This is the same client uh, whose nipple areola I have kind of worked on after doing one of these um, plaster scene examples and really studying in more detail how the little uh, white highlights at the tip of the uh, nipple might look and trying to uh, create that on a two-dimensional surface. Now, in terms of uh, artistry uh, advice um, and realism, mathematics is, is really uh, a core aspect of that. Uh, no matter what gender you are, or if you're transitioning genders, the equilateral triangle from the sternal notch to the simulated nipples is what da Vinci says the ancient Greeks wrote about as being the perfect um, kind of look uh, of the chest and gives the appearance of symmetry. Even if the chest itself is asymmetrical after surgical scarring or after reconstructed mounts, we actually see color before shape. So if you can perfect and create the illusion of symmetry on asymmetrical surface using that uh, triangle from the sternal notch, again, that's that little hollow between your clavicles, to the nipples. And if I also uh, have my apprentices do a crosshairs or a plus sign right at the tips of um, the uh, horizontal aspect of that triangle, and I no number them like one, two, three, four, and then the mirror image, which would be two, one, four, three. And then the one quadrant has to match the other side. The two quadrant has to match two, the three to three and the four to four. And uh, there's people who just wing it and they freestyle it. It never looks good. Uh, really take the time to map it out. I've been doing this for 24 years and I still draw in my crosshairs, my plus signs and my triangle. And I use that as my guide. And so if you're experimenting um, as a client of where to place rub on uh, nipple areolar tattoos or with the clay example I mentioned to experiment what projection looks like on you, use that guideline, get a ruler and do an equilateral triangle. And that's how you can determine uh, the best placement on your chest uh, if you opt not to have surgical mounds or on the surgical mounds if you do opt for that. Now we move from realism, which is the, the shading and the mathematics into the other aspect of artistry, which is the color. And this is where I think most technicians falter and where most clients get very nervous and upset following their tattoo sessions because their technician has not understood color theory, which involves the skin's color and skin undertones and how pigments appear. And the client doesn't understand how the bright colors to begin with are gonna look much more muted once healed. So if you see these um, examples, it will help you feel less nervous and more prepared and also more informed so that if you understand what your skin color and skin undertone is better than your technician, you can either choose to go to a different technician or at least to school or educate the technician that you've chosen to ensure that you get an artistic result that's optimal. So in this case, skin color, is determined by uh, the Fitzpatrick scale is what's often used in the tattoo industry to discuss skin color, which you can read up about. And the Fitzpatrick scale was uh, developed by a Harvard dermatologist and it's kind of numbered one through seven. And I think they added an eighth one recently and uh, one being very light to darker colors. Now the skin color influences what's called the value of color. That's the light or darkness. So if you look on the left-hand side in the chart, that same pigment color and these three different skin tones uh, the tattoo color is what it looks like immediately after, and you can see some of my work of the immediately after, and it's kind of commensurable to how that same color looks in those three skin tones. And it's quite bright, a little bit garish, but then the healed color is far more muted, and the darker the skin color, the more muted it will be. So again, skin color determines the light and darkness of the ultimate healed tattoo. 
but something called skin undertone is a bit different. Not many technicians understand this. And again, as a scientist, I come to art a little bit different. I'm looking at how wavelengths uh, affect the neural perceptual system and the fact that skin color is uh, uh, different from skin undertone. If you've ever gone to Benjamin Moore and get paint samples of white, for example, you'll know that there's some whites can look more yellow or some can look more bluey gray, and then some are more neutral. Well, that's what kind of what a skin undertone is. If you press down on your forearm for a moment and you lift, you're going to see after image. If you see very carefully, I have kind of a very pale greeny yellow after image. And it's very problematic with tattooing because that color, that bluey green, is going to be added to the ultimate result. So if you have a neutral undertone, which is a white after image, it'll just be a lighter version of that color and it'll affect it very similar to the skin color. If you have a warm undertone, a yellow or an orange, that's added to the color and can make it appear too bright. So a cooler color has to be chosen. But if you have a cool undertone, so pale green, uh, medium to dark green or blue, it's very difficult because it, it can lead to unrealistic effects in the skin. Because if we use brown, which reflects red, blue, and yellow wavelengths under a green or blue undertone, the blue and green predominates and you can get a blue or green nipple once healed. And you'll think, well, it was brown. Why does it look bluey green? You might see this with microbladed eyebrows if people were wondering, well, why did it go bluey green? Well, that's because you have a blue or green undertone and that was added to the brown pigment wavelengths, which ultimately leads to an unnaturalistic effect. So in the example on the right, to achieve a brown effect in someone with a green undertone, you need to use oranges, reds, or yellows. And you see how, how bright it is and how upset that client was for the first few weeks. And she gave permission. She goes, you have to show people these photos because you said it looked too bright, but you didn't say it would be orange. She says, I look like I was Jaja Gabor nipples. So it's very important that the technician understand this and that clients understand as well that It'll go too bright in the beginning, then too light, and then just right by about week three. So it looks very different during the healing process. Now, in terms of uh, what the attendees can do in terms of understanding the color and ensuring you get a good result, is you have to make sure that your technician understands color theory. Ask them if they know the difference between color theory and uh, color undertone. And see some of their healed results. Again, healed results, it's always the proof in the pudding. And here's an example, unfortunately, on the right of a brown color that was put into a, a darker brown skin tone that had a green or blue undertone. And you can see how that brown appears like a bluish gray. And this is also due to something called the Rayleigh effect. And I don't wanna to get too scientific here, but Sir Walter Rayleigh was the one who realized that dense objects will scatter wavelengths and the blue or cool will be seen uh, more readily. So all colors to some extent will look cooler in the skin, but even more so with a blue undertone. So, for technicians, my little ditty or, or the golden equation in color plus skin undertone plus the Rayleigh effect and the pigment is what heal, gives you the heal result. It's actually a complicated equation, but once you understand it, look at the hang of color theory. If you have trouble understanding everything I just said, the kind of um, you know, easier version to do this is to get acetate or vellum, which is translucent. Uh, one that's the color of your skin and one that's the undertone, put them together over the pigments and then you're going to see how those pigments look. Technicians can make swatches and perform this. And in fact, the client that I did this is not an areola example, it's a vitiligo example, but she was so upset at how orange it looked that first week that I went out and bought the vellum to show her and drove to her house and showed her that it would look a lot better in a week's time. And she calmed down and then at the end of it, she's like, you have to tell more people about this. That really helped dissolve my, my worries because seven to 14 days is a long time during that healing process to worry about the color if you feel that it looks unnatural, right? So you want to be able to understand how this works and uh, that applies to attendees as well as technicians. Now, a caveat regarding the artistry is that the 3D is illusion. It doesn't really project, remember. So if projection is important to you, there are two choices currently available. You can pair the tattoo with a prosthesis, or you can tattoo and have surgery to augment the look. And the tattooing augmented with surgery is, is the more common choice. But I just want to briefly tell you about how artistry can be paired with areola nipple prostheses or just a nipple prostheses. Newattitudebreast.ca has Canadian-made custom prosthetics, and you can either get the nipple areola prosthetic or just the nipple nub itself 
that goes over the 3D tattoo. And there's many different types of medical adhesives that can help keep it in place that are swim proof, kiss proof, tug proof, um, and also safe and non-toxic for your body. Now, artistry can be augmented with um, surgical palettes or bracts and or reconstructed nipples. This is pretty much the most common route that people tend to go. And this is the mutually reinforcing approach because you not only get the projection with the surgery, but you get any asymmetry from the resulting surgery corrected by a 3D technique with the tattooing. So in this particular case, the person has a palette or graph that's uh, creating kind of an areola, uh, but it's much larger than the other side, which upset her. And the nipple was a different shape and higher than the other side. But through a 3D effect, you can see again, because it has a blue gray undertone, I'm using oranges. And now here's the healed result, which looks more natural uh, once healed. So we have the before picture on the upper uh, left and the after picture uh, once healed on the lower left and close-ups of each uh, nipple areola complex. Now the caveat with surgically reconstructed nipples is that they can collapse over time and the tattooed nipple as it flattens out will widen the circumference of the areola. I've been doing this for now so many years and have follow up with my clients that some surgeons don't realize uh, that they do with the collapse. And so I, I advise people to opt for a smaller areola to be tattooed in the beginning so that if things collapse over time and if you're no longer a candidate to have surgically reconstructed nipples in a revision surgery because the area is no longer vascular, you're not left like this client was with very large areolas that she found upsetting. So we had to choose to do kind of darker nipples to focus attention towards the center of the design and keep everything pale and soft so that they didn't feel or look as big as they actually were. Now, what does that look like choosing a smaller areola size? Well, in this case, you can see that, you know, you're supposed to wait at least six months, sometimes up to a year to have reconstructed nipples tattooed. And in that time, the projection will diminish. And in this case, the uh, surgically reconstructed nipple uh, was a great deal smaller and a different size and shape than the existing nipple. And so you can see my artistry in the middle left there of what I showed the client during the consultation of what I would be tattooing over. And so I'm actually kind of lying or creating the illusion of a larger nipple than there's actually there and trying to create an uh, artistic result by keeping the areola uh, very feathered and soft and quite tight and slightly smaller than the existing areola. So that as that nipple continues to flatten over time, the areola circumference doesn't get too large. This brings us to technique and technique is necessary or else the artistry will not hold in the skin no matter how safely the procedure is done. I have my apprentices actually practice on my leg. Not completely crazy. I don't let them use pigment and cover me with crappy tattoos, but I do have them use uh, saline. You can see uh, Jillian is there tattooing uh, my leg. And on the very far left, the red, they're going too deep. It's bleeding too much. And in some areas, it's not bleeding enough. They're going too light. It's very much a Goldilocks situation of getting into that just over one millimeter into the dermis. And by the very end of it, they got smooth graded shading, which doesn't look too light nor too dark. And that's where they need to be. And it's very much like riding a bicycle. Once you have a mentor show you, uh, the depth and what it should feel like in both hands, then you can get it. I had this one surgeon from Chicago send me a couple photos, the first two photos there uh, of him uh, tattooing a client. The first photo he sent, I told him, well, you have to stretch the skin, you're not going deep enough. So he sent the second photo and uh, his technician sending a photo of his two finger stretch. He ended up flying up to Peterborough and I had to show him how to basically do a four point stretch to get the pigment deep enough. And you can see the resulting tattoo is as a smoother, uh, softer gradients uh, of color and shading and much more realistic. Now, technique is very important because in this case, the areola technician did the opposite of that surgeon and they went too deeply uh, when shading the nipple and they actually punctured the implant, resulting in the area having to be cut open and a graft inserted in the middle of the nipple areola um, uh, uh, 3D tattoo. And so this is obviously not, not an ideal situation and the technician felt awful. It wasn't a, uh, um, uh, an ideal situation. But the important thing is to know that if something like that should happen, 
that there are technicians who have proper technique who can still make a case like this beautiful. So what can you do to ensure your technician has proper technique? You must ask to see healed photos or ask to meet with a client. That tells you a lot. If they don't have clients that are willing to meet with you, they may not have a good rapport or empathy with their clients. Um, I think it's very important healed photos because immediately after it can look great, but then you won't know the color theory. Uh, if that's present, you won't know if the technique, if it's gonna end patchy, like those first two photos of the surgeon uh, work that I showed you. So here are healed results. This is a very complicated case. And you know, it, it, it's not an ideal situation, but it was a lot better than what things look like post-surgery. So technique advice for the surgeons and technicians watching where the gold standard in the industry is to practice on citrus fruit. Uh, however, I uh, recommend strongly bologna over a balloon. I know that sounds crazy, but it will wiggle uh, just like a real client does. It will have um, the same thickness roughly that you have to go and it will also abrade or tear if you don't wipe properly. If your technician is wiping too harshly, it can abrade the skin and increase the chances of infection. So if you're being wiped and it's hurting you during a procedure, ask them to stop and, and blot. It should be a blotting uh, motion, not a wipe. And you can see the baloney will tell you that. And this is a wonderful way uh, to learn how to, how to tattoo before you start in human skin. Now, this brings us to empathy. And a lot of people laugh when I say, you know, clients should have empathy. But I think in this day and age especially, um, the technician's interest shouldn't wane once they've received your money and sent you home. Choose someone who follows up with you uh, during the healing process. Healing takes on average five to 12, sometimes up to 14 days to the visible eye, but three weeks to stabilize in the skin. Going from, if you remember this little ditty, to bright with the scabbing and the bright pigment on top of the skin in the scab. Once that flakes, it'll look too light as the peeling is still continuing. And by week three, it should look just right. And if you have a good rapport and follow up with your technician, a lot of healing issues can be nipped in the bud. Uh, two of the main healing issues uh, are presented here. The top row is one client, the bottom row is another. And it shows the two bright, two light, just right at week one, week two, week three. And I think it's important that clients and technicians see these type of photos so that your expectations, you understand the process. Um, the first photo, one of the, the, the main problems is the tattoo rubbing against something or the client picking at it. And in this case, those little half moon shapes being picked out of the scab is a sign of self excoriation or picking with the fingernail damage. And because I had a good rapport with this client, you know, I, I basically called her on it in a gentle way. And she admitted that, yeah, she tends to pick at things that when she's nervous or anxious. And so we had a deal that she would put an elastic band on her wrist every time she felt the urge to pick, she'd snap it and give me a call, morning, noon or night. And we got her through until uh, everything was healed over. She had second week, she was despondent thinking she'd ruined the tattoo, but this is the too late phase. So I'd just give it another week and you can see the results looked, uh, start some damage from the picking, but it didn't completely ruin the tattoo. We're able to then at a second session, rectify the issue. On the bottom, a uh, very educated person, I told them to put a very thin layer of moisturizer. Uh, two or three days into it, they tell me they think they have an infection, the area is red and it's hot. I asked to see a photo through our secure uh, link that's kind of robust for PHIPAA. And the um, photo that came back was the, the bottom the bottom left one. And I was like, that's not a thin layer of moisturizer. I said, oh, whoa, 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 you got to wash that off. The area can't breathe. And sure enough, after a few hours of having flushed it, the redness subsided, the heat subsided, and it wasn't an infection. It was that it was suffocating from too much product uh, on, on the area. And once that happened, it ended to uh, uh, heal up into a, a wonderful result. So again, empathy is about being there and being able to kind of hold the hand of the client through, through the process. And one of the things that you can do to ascertain empathy is uh, uh, clients can ask to interview past clients. They can search out reviews of the technician and, and try to find out if they view tattooing as a profession or as a vocation, right? Because it's not just a job. There's better ways to make money, right? But it, 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 someone has only one body. And if you're being entrusted with that body, you have to take it seriously. And it shouldn't be about the money. It should be about helping that person move forward in their life and not taking a step back. Or even if you're very proficient and good at it, not taking the shine off an experience that should be the end of one hell of a journey.
right? In the beginning of what I like to call chapter two, a new positive way forward. And if you're a technician or surgeon watching this, you know, think about, do you do any pro bono or free work? Do you volunteer? Are you personable? Do you have a personal touch? There's courses and YouTube things you can do about how to make eye contact, how to touch their knee or look at them, how to, how to engage. And, and the idea of having follow-up protocols, it actually doesn't cost that much more in time or money to put those into place. And if it nips a healing issue in the bud, and if it makes that person more relaxed and more calm, ultimately this is gonna to lead to, to more referrals by word of mouth and increase your business. It makes good business sense to have empathy. And it's also the humane thing to do. Okay, so last part of empathy advice and what else uh, attendees and technicians can do. Uh, research options on Instagram, on art, that stands for areola restoration tattoo. Uh, technicians, I think Stacey Ray in Calgary uh, developed that uh, platform. Rethink Breast Cancer, which is one of uh, our sponsors for tonight. Um, also, the BRCA Sisterhood started in Montreal and personalink.org and Beth Fairchild. All of these uh, resources are available. And there's also resources for those who opt to not have reconstruction or tattooing. You may have heard of, you know, Save the Women, Not the Breast movement. And it was kind of scandalous to talk about that when the broad day is largely about surgeons uh, talking about surgical options. But I think in order to know whether surgery is right for you, you need to have informed consent to know what the non-surgical options are. And that's not just tattooing. It's not just prosthesis. It's also choosing to do nothing. And that is a choice. It's a valid choice. And when you look at yourself and the scars, if that's your choice of how you want to move forward, then that choice is the right one for you. And there's a whole movement um, based on the Eastern philosophy of Kinsukuroi. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, kind of movement and sentiment. And it's the idea is that celebrating scars within the design of a tattoo or choosing to do nothing after surgery are valid choices. And Kinsukuroi is the idea that you are more beautiful for having been lovingly mended and more powerful as a result. And it actually goes back to ancient Rome and Greece when the warriors would um, rub gold dust or silver dust into their wounds so that when they healed, they would shine in battle and would show uh, and instill fear and respect and awe in those around them of what they've lived through. And it's actually a very beautiful and powerful uh, philosophy. So in summary, 3D areola tattooing is the artistic illusion of protrusion or projection of the nipple on a flat surface. It should be done with specialist knowledge in four key categories, according to kind of my, my theories on this, uh, of being on both sides of the equation. Safety, artistry, technique, and empathy. Now, prices range from free through your provincial health plan to uh, or pro bono work that some artists will like myself will do so many uh, pro bono work in, in a month to several thousand dollars and the prices really vary quite a bit across Canada so you need to search into that you need to ask your surgeon about the provincial health plan most provincial health plans like oh hip in Ontario only cover areolar tattooing if it's performed by the surgeon or the surgeon's assistant. And that's why you may have heard, like, why is she talking to surgeons and technicians in this talk? There's a lot of them viewing who sincerely want to offer that service for their patients if patients aren't able to afford to come and see a technician or a tattoo artist. Now, know what you can do to ensure you've found a technician that has these four skills. And I tried to cover that in today's talks. And as for technicians, never stop honing your skills. I still, when I'm watching Netflix, sit there tattooing a balloon. My family thinks I'm crazy, but every night I do 20 minutes, 20 minutes of practice. Just think of it like exercising, anything else you do in your life. You have choices, and that's the bottom line here. You can choose tattooing, you can choose surgery plus prosthesis plus tattooing or a combination, or you can choose to do nothing. It's now in your power to choose uh, what is right for you. And that is what's so wonderful about Broad Day. It's about celebrating choices, your choices. And a huge thank you to Dr. Mitchell Brown, who founded Broad Day, I believe it was in 2007, in memory of his sister, Lisa, uh, who passed away from cancer. And it was Lisa who incidentally designed the Closing the Loop uh, breast cancer logo, the, the kind of figure eight and the idea of, you know, for eternity and moving forward and closing that loop on, on breast cancer which also forms the idea of, uh, of breasts. I'd also like to thank Natalie uh, for her help in introducing me today, Patricia and Melissa, who are the glue that keep all of the volunteers across Canada uh, able to talk to you tonight. 
and um, for you to know that I wish you every best wish in reclaiming your body and regaining control over your life and to know that if you're feeling alone right now and you're feeling despondent and overwhelmed by everything, you can choose to focus on the negative, but try to reframe that and focus on the positive. Canada is a country of helpers and there's all of these people, despite what's going on in their lives right now, who have made time for you to, to learn about what your choices are. And with choice comes decision-making and maybe for the first time in your journey, when cancer took control away, surgeons often tell you, you have this or that option and it's their skill set that dominates. But when it comes to what you do post-surgery or post-mastectomy, it's up to you now and you're finally in the driver's seat of how you want your body to look moving forward. And that's scary, powerful, and wonderful all at the same time. So embrace it and good luck with chapter two. Thank you. Okay, Kyla, can you go into the Q&A? There's a few questions there that you did not uh, share within the slides that we'll be happy to share. And I'm just going okay. to share your bibliography now while we do that. Okay, so from the anonymous attendee, I have what is the best way to find a medical tattoo practitioner in your area? Um, well, there's a lot of sources. You mentioned your breast center, uh, the Women's College in Toronto. They can obviously, they will have names of people. I would also, um, as I mentioned, look into your public health unit. Who has taken the time to register with the public health unit? Uh, tattooing is not regulated in Canada. It's a choice that technicians make to register with the health unit. I also encourage surgical offices and surgeons and their technicians to register with the health unit because the inspector will uh, talk you up in the community uh, when people um, phone asking, you know, who's reputable in the area. And let's face it, you know, safety is probably the most important thing that people are concerned about. How much does this cost? As I mentioned, it, it really does vary uh, across Canada. I'd say that the average price for uh, unilateral areola is 500 to 800. A bilateral is twice that. So you're looking between 1,000 to 1,600 and, and sometimes up to 2,000. Now, when I say average cost, that is also an average result. And like any industry, the more you pay, the more you're gonna get in terms of uh, the degree of realism, the degree of empathy that you're receiving and the time that that technician can spend with you, et cetera. So yes, it's around 500 all the way up to 2,000. Um, in that range. Um, there's a lot of pro bono work that artists like myself and others do and foundations that can help support you. Uh, P.Inc. in Montreal also is a great resource. Rethink Breast Cancer, uh, P. Inc. and Art, uh, all of those ones that I mentioned uh, in the slide would be ones to, to uh, look into. But obviously your surgeon's office and um, your hospital are also two key places. How long do you have to wait after surgery to get tattooed? Again, in the safety slide, I, I did mention uh, it's, it's recommended six to eight months, up to a year. Uh, if in doubt, ask your surgeon. For reconstructed nipples, the new um, advice that has been um, article at the bottom published last year 2020 is a robust study of best practice across North America and that's written by surgeons technicians and tattoo artists of what they recommend and that really is a wonderful resource for both uh, clients and technicians and surgeons and again what is the cost uh, I, I answered that one again but anywhere from 500 to 2000 uh, listening to you makes me hopeful Thank you. Well, well, that's wonderful because, you know, hope is the hope of moving forward with your life. It's so important, especially in dark times. I'm a two time cancer survivor. And actually, my little girl was in a very serious accident uh, just under a month ago. And so I know a lot about hope. Hope will get you through the dark times. You know, um, I think Leonard Cohen talks about, uh, I think it's an anthem, the cracks are where the light gets in, it comes from a Persian poet, Rumi. And the idea that in the darkness, when there's cracks, and think of it as your scars or, or the hell you've been through. There will be the sunlight, there will be light and, and focus on that. Try to find the rainbows through the tears and, and look for the helpers. And broad A is a, is a great start. So you're off to a great start there. Uh, thank you. You're uh, knowledgeable and have offered so much hope. Thank you. Does the tattoo fade after a certain number of years? Well, that depends on the technique of the artist uh, as well as the pigments they're using. So the, the pigments that uh, I use, the medical grade ones, again, they're around $80 a color. You can research them, Biotech or Biotic Fusia. 
uh, they're sterile single use uh, around anywhere from 60 to 80 dollars per color i might be using 10 to 12 colors over two sessions and you can see that where where the price uh, starts to creep up someone who's using a 20 dollar bottle in between clients over a year uh, those pigments a lot of them coming out of china and the meche uh, factories um, they're not as good right it's again in any industry uh, the more you spend you tend to have better quality and, and longer lasting results where can i get temporary nipple tattoos that's a wonderful question a lot of um technicians uh, have pivoted especially during the pandemic into creating uh non-toxic uh, rub-on areola tattoos and if you go into the gram or instagram or onto google images and you type in rub on areola tattoos you'll see a lot of different options and it's a wonderful way to to uh check out an artist's artistry. I think that's it on questions on my end. Natalie, do you have any other questions that came through you? Nope, that's everything. Thank you for answering them all. Uh, and good night, everyone across Canada. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I really love talking about this. You can always reach out to me at uh, cosmetictransformations.com or um, cancerconnect.ca. And uh, again, every best wish for your journey.